Well, good morning. A, a little different when you go from a PhD to myself. Thanks so much for taking the time this morning. A little bit of background. Um, originally, I'm a farm kid from Wisconsin, was in FFA, 4-H, did things of that nature, tomatoes, echinacea, dairy country there. Uh, was cr recruited by the military, was an airborne romance language cryptolinguist for the Air Force, so I speak Spanish, a few indigenous languages, actually a disabled vet, got hurt out of the service just about 11 years ago, flipped a coin, made it to Colorado, found cannabis, went from 14 meds down to like cannabis, so this isn't just business, this is personal to me. So in this track, essentially understanding the scientific components of this plant, the main things that I wanted you to understand that this is purely an agricultural commodity in a new agricultural industry, but you have to understand the vectors of this plant. If you were trying to make tires or pickles, you want to start with good cucumbers or good rubber. The same with this industry. So a lot of what you see is like the smoke and mirrors, but when you get down to science, it's not just ego, which our industry has plenty of. Uh, or anecdotal of, well, I did this nutrient on two plants and it did this, so obviously it makes a huge change. So today, by the end of this presentation, I just want you to understand what is the vector? What is this plant? And then how, through business, through regulation, through finance, can you get into the industry knowing where to start from? So, you know, when you think about cannabis, here's this plant, cannabis, marijuana, it's got all these different names and a pretty long history. But when you think about it, it's a weed, right? We call it weed. It's not that challenging to grow weed. There's a reason that we always, as farmers, grow corn in places like Iowa. I don't have warehouses in Las Vegas growing corn to do extraction for corn syrup to make my infused beverages here with corn for Pepsi. You don't see potato farmers industrially doing the same thing. So with cannabis, we have to follow state-by-state -state specific guidelines and laws. So there is a time and place that you can't just come from traditional agriculture or scientific understanding. You have to take the best of that and match it to a very limited complex framework, state by state, even municipality by municipality. But when you understand the basis of this plant, everything you see for the rest of this conference and your time in the industry, you'll be, be better through this presentation, better to know what's real and what's not. Always get down to it. Is this science? Is this agriculture? Where does this come from? And what are the basis and the needs from this plant? There's a lot of conversations, indica sativa, indica, you know, cushes, afghanics, you know, all of the ruderalis. But it's all the same as we're going to start to get into here. So when you think about where this plant came from, I, I always want everyone to remember, you know, this isn't my plant, this isn't your plant, even if you patent a piece or you put a genetic marker, this is something that's been in our blood for well over 10,000 years. So commonly this industry is like, oh, this new LED light, this new feature, this and that. My industry is over 10,000 years old, which this industry is. And if you embrace that from the start, your business ventures will be successful. When you just have an outside extractor who has 10 years of underground cannabis experience compared to food formulation scientific people that run operations for lavender, for all of these other essences, and food production, coconut oils, extraction, when you match outside industry with this as an agricultural commodity and understand the science of it, the specific phenols, not just, hey, I shoot butane on this and get some really dank wax. I'm selling that stuff for 50 bucks a gram, it's great. But there's a reason that that's so dangerous. But if any of you have ever had coconut oil extract before, that's most likely been processed with butane in a very regulated, scientific, USDA, food certified lab and facility, not by people with flat brims and tie-dye in rooms that are exploding across the country. So even though like we talk butane, it's very, very dangerous if it's done by the wrong people. That's why our companies, we won't touch it because it's got such a bad rap. But the scientific component, the companies that do that well do very well. But when you think about where this started, essentially it's gone through all of our blood, the ships that came across this country with hemp ropes, like our constitution being written on this, this plant is in all of our blood. That's how we've allowed a population of over three, seven billion people by commodities like this. And by legalizing cannabis through the science of this genus and this species, the 2014 Farm Bill and other provisions have allowed us to scale and to start to create a whole new industry that was stolen from us back in the 30s. When you understand the history of this plant, it wasn't the cannabis and why we're here. It was the Great Dane of it, which we'll get into. So this has been moving around the country. It's everywhere. I mean, I'm sure I've even heard of some scientists down in Antarctica that had their little hydroponic experience. So we've essentially got a weed growing on seven continents at any one time here. So you think about this plant. As a farmer, if you're talking corn, potatoes, wheat, soybeans, you have cannabis, a dioecious plant, which you know in the next slide we'll mention, it means it keeps its house, it, its sex in two houses, dioecious. There's male plants, there's female plants. 
boys and girls, when we get together, we make more of ourselves often. So that's why in our industry, we always talk about the ladies, women of the cannabis variety, the ones that we use for flour for extracted products. Males are only used by breeders, or if you planted seeds and you didn't sex them early enough, and then all of a sudden you've got some seeded plants. And if you understand, like, sin semilla, like the word Spanish, without seed. So that's an unpollinated female plant that then, essentially a female, she's trying to get all big, all beautiful, all sticky, just to catch a little bit of pollen to get fertilized to be able to actually make seeds for that next year. It's not just constantly coming up year over year. So when you think about this plant, like with our, with our hemp division, we did this three, four years ago. Okay, where, what does hemp want? What does cannabis want? Well, 25 to 35 inches of annual precip a year. Ag zones 5A through about nine. It can go on different ranges of that, but for optimal. Sandy loam, well-drained soil. We put these six vectors in through like Market Watch, uh, Global View, which does this for like corn and other commodities. Kenneth Benchmarks also tracks some of that with the vectors of what's this plant need for agriculture. And you put all that on a map and you see what are the seven best states to grow hemp at. Even though I can grow it in 17 states, long term I'm not gonna be growing copious amounts of hemp in Arizona. I mean, if I've got eight inches of precip a year, I have to do augmentation. It's gonna be more expensive with irrigation, fertigation, and then it's gonna be a small market. And even to process those hemp products, I'm then gonna need $10 million in infrastructure for decorders, redders to make all those products. You wanna grow it where the plant wants to grow at the least cost of production. So when you understand the science of this plant, what sort of ag zones, what daytime, nighttime temperatures? Something really to consider in this industry for this plant, you've got indoor, greenhouse, outdoor, some hybrid approaches. When you play indoor, you essentially are playing God. Every one of these vectors you must control. Temperature, airflow, humidity, air circulation, biosecurity plans, worker process flow, pollination. So much you have to control. In a greenhouse, you can do like the temperature, airflow, CO2, you can do those things, but with less cost of production because you're using my lighting company. I know I'm not allowed to do pitches for my companies here, but my lighting company is called The Sun. We've got a demo outside. You can look up, it's really bright. Plants love it. 425 million years, it's been grown plants. All right, that's my pitch there. So when, when you use what's given, it's much easier. In cannabis, when you think about that sticky, you know, bring it down layman here, that stickiness, when it's, this plant is producing cannabinoids in these resins, it's actually almost like sunscreen for its sex organs. And then the more the cannabinoids and terpenes are being created to actually protect these sex organs as they're growing, and then she just, you know, just like a, you know, going to the dance, she's 25, 30, she's getting older, she really just wants to find a gentleman, so she's gonna get as big and sticky as possible to be able to catch one. And then male pollen can go up to 10 miles, so we never do our cannabis or hemp anywhere close to each other all breeding facilities separate. You never want to do those same things because boys, we know, like we always find a way. And this one does the same thing. So when you understand what's the plant need, what sort of pH ranges, this is where it's gonna grow naturally for outdoor. Outdoor plants as well, that sex screen for the sun organs, or I'm sorry, the sunscreen for the sex organs, that's when you're actually getting like UVA, UVB light, which increases potency. And indoors, some operators found out about this. Wow, that, that's actually antifungal light. Let's plug in some UV lights and have our workers walk around and like do this and it's gonna kill fungus and make them more potent while you're causing eye cancer to your workers and that's not exactly uh, very good on the OSHA terms. So trying to play God inside, it's gonna cost you a lot of money. Outdoors is the easiest, just as a farmer, we've got a lot of liabilities. Hail, hail took out a third of a crop of uh, a client of ours in Colorado this year. Hail cloths would have maybe cost 100000 for the whole farm. They definitely lost more than that. And some of the larger operators in South, South Pueblo and those other areas, they're, they're having, you know, whenever you've seen and heard of Northern California, these 10-pound plants, when you give the plant what it wants, temperature, airflow, humidity, the right nutrients and biological systems, it will soar. But no matter what, I couldn't take someone who was four feet tall genetically and make them a Michael Jordan. So like starting with good genetics in the right location, it all adds up like spokes in a wheel. You could have the best light, the best LED in the world, and the best nutrient, but if you have bad temperatures, bad low nighttime temperatures, not enough CO2 enrichment, that plant's never gonna meet its full potential. So when you're designing operations from a scientific agricultural standpoint, what do I need to give this plant? If it's indoors, knowing the light nighttime temperatures, the high temperatures for the day, that CO2 parts per million, you create the vectors for the plant with good genetics, and that's when you get those 10 pound plants instead of the cute little half an ounce plants indoors. Even if you cycle them through five times a year, when you do the math, outdoor greenhouse hybrids are you know, 16 to 25 times better. 
There's a reason, like I said, we own less than 0.1% of all traditional ag is done indoors or hydroponic. Hydroponic was so great because we went indoors to hide as an industry, but because then you didn't have to move soil and all these heavy nutrients and no smell, no fish emulsion. But realistically, like with the heavy metal absorption and the cost to do hydroponic on large scale industrial, there's some winners doing it. But there's a reason that very few farmers do that for strawberries, tomatoes, orchids, less than 0.1%. So if ag doesn't do it and farmers are pretty frugal, especially when you're making like $171 an acre, when we can make about 3 million an acre from an outdoor plot with 300 plants, and that's just flour, I mean about 16M if you're talking extracting products for the volume of extracts they make, you have to think from knowing science and knowing ag and what this plant wants, will my business allow that? Will my investment be good? And then will the scientific research we're doing actually have merit and be representative of this plant as an agricultural commodity? So in, indoors, obviously, you've got your, your temperatures, highs and lows. When I say there's 28 degrees, we've had some hemp, hemp plants actually get down to 20 degrees before. Usually temperature, you'll sometimes to get some purple colors. It is a pubescent plant. It does have some hairs for insulation. But when you're trying to go for that optimal, you know, no more than like kind of 77 degrees, no less than 65, that's like your nice magic window. You can go a little less and a little more, especially with CO2, but you always want to think, what's that, that zone that I need? And then do you want growers to go around and turn on lights, turn on fans? No, like normal agriculture has Wadsworth, Argus, Priva, like agricultural components that turn on this, turn off that, CO2 turns on, it's auto-regulating, almost homeostatic. And those are the industries that are really have a lot of promise because it programs all of this in and knows specifically through fertigation, irrigation, sensors when the plants need to be watered. That's what we do in agriculture, Henry Ford style. When I show some of our clients like these four acre greenhouses with benches that are five feet by 20 feet long, just shh, 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 like going like a normal greenhouse, we're like, oh wow, like we go and we water each plant individually. We like move each plant, we touch each plant every day, it needs the love, but in normal agriculture, this plant just wants to be left alone and put in the right environment. You give her what she wants, you take care of her, she'll take care of you, as that's our, always our expression in the industry. Knowing for like nutrients, for example, you'll hear and see lots and lots about nutrients. So, you know, I already mentioned my lighting company, you know, awesome, the sun. Now let's think about like a sequoia tree. Who's fertilizing a sequoia? Or you've all heard of maybe like the Amazon rainforest before, big kind of forest. They only have, like I worked in South America, they only have about this much topsoil but you have this enormous ecosystem going on. No one's fertilizing it, it's biomimicry. It works with itself. Certain leaves decompose, feed this bacteria, that bacteria feeds this virus, that virus feeds this fungi, which ties into the plant. You feed biological soil communities, and that feeds plants. So in nutrients with cannabis, there are specific nutrients at specific stages of growth that drastically increase yields. But when it comes to nutrients, there's no one nutrient, there's no one product that's gonna do better than having the vectors of this plant done correctly. It, cutting corners, like using pacrobutazole or some growth hormone. When you think about all these growth hormones that are used in cannabis with, usually marketed with uh, voluptuous women and cartoon characters, that's usually how we sell nutrients in the industry. Um, even though you might be buying a bottle of something that's 69.95 and it's only got 1% Epsom salt in it, magnesium sulfide, and then you're shipping 99% water weight, and this cool product that you love, that your homie sells you a discount deal, it's just Epsom salt. So you think like nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, like NPK, your macronutrients, micronutrients, all super important, but so much of that is in soil communities, and when you're doing purely hydroponic, you have to augment every single component. And if you have one thing off in that system, your plants can die, like totally dissolved solids, pH, parts per millions, and in the wrong balance at the wrong time. But typically when you think about it, younger plants need more nitrogen, medium age plants start to need less nitrogen, more phosphorus, flowering plants need phosphorus and then potassium and a lot of uh, potassium at the end. They always need magnesium, they always need calcium, they always need boron, they always need these little components. But with soil, that's broken down in the system through biomimicry. You feed the soil just like a sequoia, it feeds itself, you get giant trees. So in cannabis, instead of just thinking, I need part A, part B, this one spends 70K every quarter on nutrients with cartoons on them, that worked back in the day because most growers were 30 to 50 year old single white males and have, you know, kind of in that category, you know, sex sells and that's why they just push these products. But long term, the general hydroponics place thinking that the nutrients will always be the big play when you know science and ag. I can buy seven, 250 gallons of organic molasses delivered for less than $400. And that's a major food source with micronutrients for a lot of my beneficial bacteria. 
kelp, for an example, one of the most magical things that you can use in, in very small doses for all the micronutrients that are required, I get that same super tote for less than $300. So something you're going to spend $500 for a five gallon thing with a cartoon on it, or you can get things shipped that you need forklifts to move around. Agriculture does this. When you think about soil, even the soil mixes, 75% of that's inert material anyways. It's just the substrate to hold the roots to allow biological microbial relationships to happen, porosity and so forth. But the same product like ProMix that you're going to buy for $56.95 for a 3.5 cubic foot little bundle, that's their division for cannabis. Like they have another separate company for ag, that same thing's about $17. But hey, you got the ProMix and no harm on any of those companies. But there's a reason that normal farmers or our you know, clients in like Pennsylvania, for example, that have a four acre Christmas cactus farm or another with 14 acres of poinsettias, they mix all their own soil, they buy super totes of nutrients, and they, they have three nutrients for an entire dioecious flowering plant. They're not having 70 different nutrients there, pH ups, pH downs, different chemicals. And when you think about hydroponic, a lot of those are derived from heavy metals. Cannabis, as you'll hear later today, it's a bioaccumulator and it, it actually pulls those up. So we call them like the four horsemen, like mercury, arsenic, lead, cambium. It pulls all those things up. So if you're using a nutrient derived from that and your state then starts to do heavy metal testing, you're pretty much screwed. Just like the same thing happening in Oregon with pesticide testing. So you have to know what are the rules for your state, how do I deal with the scientific components of this, how do I look through the smoke and mirrors of this industry, find science and guidance to actually make a company an investment or an opportunity. So this plant, you know, typically in cannabis, most people go from a mother plant where you have a female that produces the same phenotypic expressions. They take cuttings of those, you know, anywhere from three to 12 inches, depending on methodology. It's cut, oftentimes put into a cloning gel. Those cloning gels have NAA and a lot of antifungals that are systematic pesticides that inoculate that plant for life so it'll never actually hold and host a lot of the biological microbes that I want that defend my plant from molds and powdery mildews and certain sort of insect attacks. So how you actually go through this process, like typically like a seed, it's vibrant, just like a child. You come into the world fresh, no problems. But when you clone, 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 just like Dolly the sheep, you get shorter, 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 shorter. I have some clones that we've been cloning since 1996. I think of this purple train wreck, blue moonshine combo, Oaktown, Crippler it's called. Resistant to everything, amazing, but it's still from clone, and we can never get it seed again. So now we have this interesting two to three year period for science to start bringing the breeding back. Um, life cycle, when it goes through this process, it's always determined by the, the amount of light, essentially. If it's 12 hours of daylight, 12 hours of nighttime, similar to like being close to the equator, it'll trigger a plant to flower indoors. 18 hours plus, it won't. Some people think that having 24 hours under a plant is perfect, because then like, I don't have to deal with like low time temperatures, it's great. There's a little thing called the Krebs cycle. Cannabis, remember, like, plants are purely a sugar factory. They take six CO2, 6H2O and my lighting company, the sun, through a magical process we call photosynthesis, makes C6H1206, which is glucose, one molecule, and 6O2, oxygen. So they take CO2, water, and sunlight, and they make oxygen and sugar. And polysaccharides, they bond them together. So at nighttime, they need that dark cycle to do the Krebs cycle when they take the energy and convert it into sugar. It can do it in the presence of light, 30% less efficient, but it's not natural. You always think biomimicry. Why reinvent the wheel here? So you've got different flowering times that determine when this is going to happen. We'll see more and more seed production plants in the future. But right now, about 95% of the industry is purely from clones. And you always want to do it. Think Gregor Mendel from back in school with the peas and the whites and the pinks and the reds. You always want to start with like a good F1 like, or a good female um, first round genetic and then take clones from that, not just have your veg room, send your workers in, they all take these random clones from all these next rounds, it really convolutes your genetic pool. So in cannabis, dioecious, sex in both houses, male and female. You typically can see this after about six weeks, once you change the light a little bit, you'll actually start to see it. When you see boys, bad, unless you're a breeder. Uh, when you see females, females are the ones that actually have those hairs, those calyxes, those pistils coming out, instead of the male with just their sex organs. But this is something a lot of breeders are getting into feminized seeds, using a few different um, titaniums, a few different things to, to mimic that. But realistically, good breeding will be a huge sector scientifically, but it's hard right now to protect a lot of your IP unless you have great IP lawyers. So we talked about sativa, indica, um, same species. We've all seen a poodle before, like Little Dog. We've seen a Great Dane. 
Same thing for cannabis. Hemp is like a great dane. Poodles are poodles for what the purpose is. We bred them selectively, just like wolves back in the day to make certain breeds of dogs for what we needed them to do, to hunt rats, to pull sleds, to look, I mean, some of the dogs, I don't even know why we breeded them, but same thing in cannabis. Like, so that's kind of a big thing. When you know the life cycles of these plants and the variations, you can always tell a lot by looking at the leaf. There's great scientific companies that help to do the sexting of these plants, but it's all the same when it comes down to it. One species, everyone will think there's subspecies between this. Think science again. The biological definition of a species is the ability to make sexually viable offspring. We've got bio degrees, did that for years. So if I can get a boy and a girl together, make babies that can make more babies, that's a species. But if I were to take a horse and a mule, donkey, like that's where it might make something, but it can't reproduce, so it's not its own species. So with cannabis, remember, think about it, it's just like dogs. Some are taller, some are shorter. If I get the wrong ones together, they will breed. And then it'll be half of a Great Dane and half of a Poodle, or like half of a Bulldog, half of a Shih Tzu, you get a little bullshit. Same thing in cannabis. <laughs> Like if you take, I've done it with hemp, like you take a great hemp plant below 0.3% THC, breed it with this one, start playing around, all of a sudden I've got half of this, half of that, now it's illegal under the farm bill. So genetics are huge, but it's knowing your key genetics as you start. You can have the best facilities and operators in the world, but if they have ba bad genetics, you'll never get anywhere. Like you have to have good genetics like nature and nurture. But the nature is pretty easy when you think about the vectors that this plant needs. The nurture is the environment and how your cultivation methodology or extraction processing will go. But we have to think, kind of in the, this last kind of closing, this is not just science, this is not just agriculture, this is ethnobotany. When you think about Wade Davis and some of the best ethnobotanists in the world, how do cultures relate with plants for food, medicine, all of the different products that they make? That's what we've done for years with coffee, with other ropes, with flaxseed, with potatoes. So with cannabis, with hemp and the farm bill, we've got so much that's gonna happen. With the medical programs and the new eight of nine votes this last week, so great, but now the adult use happening all over the country, it's how our culture is going to work with this plant again. And it's the first time in so long that people have been asking questions. Where does my food come from? Where does my medicine come from? Who's growing this? Is this safe or not? Like, are there pesticides on this? No one asked questions about that in the black market a long time ago. So now I say to you, if you're in the industry, this isn't just a job, it's not just an investment. You know, I started our companies 10 years ago and still don't do days off, have six now and just keep growing. You're an advocate for the industry. And what you do will resonate through this industry. And what's, what we did good and bad in Colorado has been copied and mimicked and now it's our responsibility to take what we've learned from what worked and what didn't work to come up with a new model in new states and new countries and stop repeating the past. There's no need to reinvent the wheel just like cotton, just like timber. What do other industries use for quality assurance? You think as a kid, we had semen to cellophane tracking for bulls. Same thing for cannabis, seed to sale. We're not reinventing the wheel here. If you've ever read The Jungle or Upton Sinclair, you think, okay, we don't want that to happen where producers can provide their own meat samples or dairy samples. Think, same thing for cannabis. So no matter what your outside industry experience or acumen is, be it investing or scientific process, Remember some of the things we talked about today. This is much easier than almost 9,000 people are gonna tell you about at this conference. Agriculture, it's in all your blood. I mean, if you're wearing clothes or you ate food this morning, it's due to agriculture. If cannabis, we have growers, and like they're, they're different than farmers. No, you're not, grow up. Like this is agriculture, we're not special. And like just embrace ag and you'll do better. And we are very special, very special plant. The phenols, the medicinal components of this from my life and others, we've seen great things, but it's barely begun. But remember, have a responsibility. If you make bad products, someone trying a product for the first time might have a bad experience and hate cannabis for the rest of it, and it could have been advantageous. So do your homework, science, agriculture, production, manufacturing, GAPs, GMPs. A lot of the scientific guidance will set you up for success in this industry. So I guess that's all I've got here. Chris, uh, any, any time for a few of those?
essentially his question, so after that last slide from the last presenter, there's 10 different independent standards organizations for cannabis that have popped up. So now we're at the point, what sort of guidance would we recommend to follow for these sorts of operations for quality assurance plans? Super good question. Um, my common response to this is that as taxpayers, which we all are in one way or another, hopefully, and if you're in the industry, definitely pay your taxes. Um, we pay the FDA, the USDA, and the EPA to keep us safe on a lot of regards. Their hands are tied when it comes to cannabis. So what we, I don't know if anyone's heard of it, there's this little thing called Google out there. You can ask it questions. So what we started doing two years ago is actually looking to, for our extraction companies, what is FDA and USDA guidance on formulation science? What do we need to do preemptively? Because the state only gives this much guidance, which a lot of that's not the best, but we already have this guidance that 90, 95% of it's applicable to cannabis. So we already use EPA, FDA, USDA guidance on formulation, cultivation methodologies, look into BMPs, best management practices for agriculture, uh, University of Massachusetts, maybe a little free gold here, has free BMPs for indoor, outdoor greenhouse, thousands of page documents on how to run facilities with quality assurance and quality controls. I would say look to outside industry guidance. I'm a big fan of PFC. Americans for Safe Access have been around for a long time. Their PFC certifications are phenomenal. Low cost for certifications and it's taking it to that next level until the feds can kind of help us out. But without quality assurance or standards, don't even get into the game at all. And if you can own the means of production from cultivation to extraction, if you're just an extractor without standards buying dry plant material, you've got essentially five times more on fresh plant material. But our industry couldn't figure out how to deal with water not that hard from normal science. So yeah, the standards look to what's already out there and that's what we've kind of taken to that level for years. The same with OSHA. OSHA doesn't touch this industry, but you need to know it, like worker protective standards, pesticide applicator trainings. Even if the state doesn't mandate it, do it. What's a normal ag production company need to follow? Follow that plus what the state wants and always be on the cusp and innovation of that standards and quality assurance. Okay, we gotta wrap it up. Sorry. Super. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much, Chris. Appreciate it. Fun day. Thank you. Thank you.